it's really a pleasure for me to visit uh, Sirm Lumini, at least virtually. I wanted uh, until the last moment to come physically, but unfortunately now we have just a virtual event. So I will start with my presentation. I hope I will speak about rather simple things. So what I will speak about? I will speak about approximation of uh, subspaces of d-dimensional space. So if we consider Rd, uh, this linear equation determines a linear subspace of Rd, and we are interested how close integer points can lie to this linear subspace. In fact, to look for these close integer points, it is reasonable to consider irrationality measure function. Here I introduce it at my slide. So what does this function doing? We look for the set of integers in a box. Here, uh, modulus stand for subnorm. Of course, we can consider different norms. Sometimes it will be much more convenient. And I will speak about one problem related to different norm. And this stands for the distance to the nearest integer. So here we have distances to the nearest integer from points of this form. So I will, in, in, uh, on my next slide, I will draw the slope, the graph of this irrationality measure function. Oh, okay. So I draw here the graph. So this is uh, the definition of irrationality measure function from my previous slide. And I am showing that it is a piecewise constant function. So once upon a time at certain t nu, we have the relative minima of this form, and then we increase t until we get another relative minima. So until there is no other integer point, the function is constant. So I would like to say just a few words about this function. It may happen that function be equal to zero sometimes. When does it happen? It happens when the columns of matrix theta together with unit vectors, this one unit vector, this is, this is another one. So this, this unit, ve unit vectors, maybe, 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 maybe I will not, I will not write it. So some kind of a, a linear dependence over Z. So in this case, this sequence, this sequence of best approximations will be finite. So I will be not interested in this case. Sometimes something, uh, some other problems may happen. For instance, if we have a jump, this jump corresponds to an integer vector. What integer vector? So the value of x and the value of y, the value of y is hidden here in these nearest integers. But it may happen that the value of y is not uniquely determined. Of course, in the case of soup norm, this, happen, this cannot happen if uh, the entries of matrix are independent, linear independent over z. But if we have some different matrix and so on, it may happen. So as usual, 
the sequence nevertheless is well defined and the sequence of vectors is uniquely defined and in all my result i will suppose that this sequence is uniquely defined okay so at this picture i also draw two curves so here are points with white interior and this is a curve t to the power minus omega hat which is in some sense close to these points and here is a blue curve t to, to minus omega which correspond to these black points the exact definitions of what is omega and omega hat will be on the next slide okay so omega and omega hat are their finite exponents omega is ordinary diophantian exponent expo ordinary diophantian exponent it is defined by this formula and to make this formula more clear i give an alternative uh, definition some kind of explanation what does this uh, formula mean so omega is suprema of such gammas for which for infinitely many t's for an increasing sequence of t's such an equation such an inequality has infinitely many solutions and it means i am going to my back slide so omega means something like this so we we draw this blue curve and infinitely often these black points go below the curve t minus and omega hat what is which is called uniform exponent is defined in similar way but here instead of lim inf yeah inf we have here lim su it means that omega is the supremum of gammas for which this system has solutions in integer x for all arbitrary large t's so on my previous slide it means that these uh, points with empty interior lie behind this red curve it is very important for me now that uh, one set includes uh, from definition omega and omega hat includes another set and this immediately gives us the inequality that omega is greater than omega hat and this inequality is called trivial inequality trivial inequality because uh, you do did not uh, uh, it is not necessary to understand the nature of these exponents uh, to prove this inequality okay so i am continuing with my next slide so i would like to uh, first of all i would like in my lecture to define all the notions which i am speaking about so another notion from the title is badly approximable um, vectors or badly approximable matrices so what do i mean it is quite clear that for any t so it is quite clear that for any t the irrationality measure function is less than e to the power m over n in fact this is minkowski convex body theorem but sometimes it happens that this order m over n cannot be improved so in this case matrix is called 
badly approximable matrix. And we know a lot about the set of badly approximable matrices from Hinchin, we know that the set of badly approximable matrices has zero measure. And from Schmidt, we know that it is a thick set. Schmidt proved in his famous paper that it is a winning set in the space of matrices, and every winning set has full Hausdorff dimension. Moreover, when we were speaking about exponents, so these omega hat and omega here are the definitions. So for badly approximable numbers, everything is absolutely clear. So omega is equal to omega hat and is equal to this critical exponent. Okay, so now I'm continuing. Oh, one moment, sorry. This, uh, so, today I will speak probably about three special cases. The most simplest case, when m equal one and n equal one, this is just approximation to one number, but I would like to speak about multidimensional phenomena and I would like to compare them with one dimensional approximation theory. So I will say few, maybe not even few, not, not very few words about this simplest case. I will speak about simultaneous approximation when we approximate one dimensional subspace in RD and the case for one linear form when we approximate a linear subspace of co-dimension one. Of course, when we deal with uh, subspaces of intermediate dimension, everything becomes even more interesting and even more difficult. But I'm afraid I will have no time to speak about the last case. If, it, uh, if, if I have time, I will say, few words, maybe just few. Okay, so now I'm continuing. Well, so as I promised, I must make it a little bit. I started with, uh, uh, I, I wanted to start with the case with a simple one dimensional approximation. So what happens in one dimensional case? So the jumps of irrationality measure function are just the sequence of the uh, denominators of convergence to theta and for this for well, this convergence, uh, we have nice recurrent formula. Also, I will write the same formula for the remainders, as it will be of certain importance. And I will speak about just irrational case. So in this case, omega hat is always equal to one and omega without hat can be arbitrary from one to plus infinity. Okay. So now I am turning to multidimensional case. To the case of simultaneous approximation. But I am not able to forget the one dimensional case where we have continued fractions. So if I'm looking for 
two successive best approximations in one dimensional case, everybody knows that the determinant constructed from the coordinates of two successive approximation in this case is equal to plus or minus one. And I would like to recall what happens in higher dimension with uh, similar determinant. First of all, if we have simultaneous approximation for completely irrational numbers, then probably it was first observed by Yarnik. We have the following phenomenon. If we consider three consecutive best approximation vectors, it happens that infinitely many often they are independent. Yarnik observed this fact and used it to prove an untrivial bound between omega and omega hat. You may remember that I wrote that we have trivial bounds and in the case n equal to one, when equal to, of course, we know that omega hat is greater than one half and this factor is greater or equal than one. So this may give an improvement of this trivial bound. However, there is a problem in high dimensions. What is the problem? So this property discovered by Yarn, I mean the existence of three consecutive independent uh, best approximation vectors has no immediate uh, generalization to higher dimension. It is easy to, to construct independent thetas such that if we consider a matrix from successive best approximations, I mean D nu, Z nu plus one, and so on, D nu plus N. So here are the coordinates of successive, uh, the coordinates of successive best approximation vectors. And it may happen that the rank of this matrix is not greater than three. So why it is important? I will try to explain it on my next slide. So we see maybe I will come back for a moment, that there is a trivial bound omega is greater than omega hat. In any dimension, we have an improvement, which is reasonable only in dimension two. By the way, it happened that in dimension two, it is optimal. Probably it was first observed by Michel Raran in his four exponent theorem. But what is the optimal bound in higher dimension? The optimal bound was conjectured several years ago by Schmidt in Zoom and Zoomerer in their study of parametric geometry of numbers. I don't want to speak about what, parametric, what is parametric geometry of numbers. I will just formulate the conjecture maybe not in a proper way, and at least not in a way uh, in which it was formulated by Schmidt and Zumer. However, they conjecture that the optimal lower bound for omega over omega hat comes from the special case when this matrix infinitely many often has full rank. So this example 
shows that it is not true and there is a problem to prove this conjecture immediately. If it be so, infinitely often have had the maximal rank, then the conjecture follows almost immediately. However, it is not so. In terms, uh, in terms of some quantitative bounds, this conjecture can be written in such a way. So omega is greater than omega hat times some value j, where j is a root of this equation, but a special root which is greater than one. Okay, it is a compact short equation. Originally, there was a different equation, but I would like to write it in this shortened form. However, you see that this equation has a root x equal one, so we do not look into uh, for, for this root. We are looking for the unique root, which is uh, greater than one. So, by the way, Schmidt and Zumer conjectured um, uh, the optimal bound for omega over omega hat in both cases, in the case of uh, simultaneous approximation, m equal one, and in the case of one linear form, n equal one. And in the case of linear form, the polynomial is a little bit different, but I can write a polynomial which includes all the polynomials here. It is here, and you can calculate, so if, for instance, m equal one, it means that it is simultaneous approximation. Then this disappears, and this is just the same as that. If you do not look for this x equal one. So, however, this polynomial can be written uh, for arbitrary m and n. I said that I will not speak about arbitrary m and n, but just few words. Okay, I will say few words. So if the corresponding matrix has maximal rank, then it is easy to prove that omega and omega hat in the case of arbitrary m and n are connected by the similar inequality where this g is a root of this new polynomial. However, I am not sure that the conjecture for arbitrary m and n here is true. Moreover, I think that Wolfgang Schmidt was also not sure that conjecture is true for arbitrary m and n. And I think that Schmidt and Zumerer did not conjecture the bound for general M and N, they have conjectured it just for simultaneous approximation and linear form. This conjecture was recently proved uh, in the case of simultaneous approximations and in the case of linear form by Antoine Marna and me. I hope Antoine is somewhere here. So, and another proof was given by Nguyen, Coels, and Roa. By the way, they had a pattern which gives a proof a little bit earlier than we invented our own pattern. However, now I should speak about what is pattern here. So my next slide explains something explains something about geometry of this problem. I will go back for a moment. You see here Yarnik proved that there are three independent vectors. So this corresponds to the first picture. 
in the theory of patterns. Please have a look here. Dimension is three. This J3 is Yarnik's pattern. Here we have three independent vectors. But in higher dimension, we do not have successive independent vectors. What shall we do? We invent something different. So we have three independent, we have uh, in, in dimension four, we can produce the following construction from best approximations. Three independent vectors, three another independent vectors, and the two last vectors of the first triple and the two first vectors of the last triple are connected just uh, by two dimensional subspace. They generate the same two dimensional subspace. What to do in dimension five? You should take two patterns of dimension four and connect it by a three dimensional subspace. It will be pattern in dimension five. And a general rule that pattern in higher dimension can be obtained by two patterns in lower dimension by some procedure. The bound for omega over omega hat can be proved for any triple, any Yarnik triple. And in pattern, we have several Yarnik triple, and theorem states that at least one of these triples give the desired bound. In our pattern, we have O from two to the power n places. O to the power n places. Two to the power n places. Our pattern is rather natural, but if we compare our pattern, so we have two to the power n places. Of course, these authors also use a certain pattern, but their pattern is rather different. It has O of n places where we have a possible optimal bound for omega over omega hat. And it's uh, interesting that these patterns do coincide in dimension four, of course, in dimension three, but in higher dimension, they're different. Okay, so now I explained to you some geometry, some underlying geometry for the solution of Schmidt Sumerer conjecture. And I would like to say that the analysis of this geometry leads to some strange observation related to badly approximable numbers. So now I am turning to my next topic, badly approximable numbers. And as usual, I will start with one dimensional situation. So number is called badly approximable when this inequality holds. So uh, irrationality measure function uh, has the maximal order of uh, the minimal order of decreasing to zero. Clearly, it is equivalent to the statement that partial quotient of continued fraction expansion for theta, this is expansion for theta, are bounded. Okay, well, I will recall these recurrent formulas. And I would like to 
look at these recurrent formulas and to uh, give maybe alternative definition of a partial quotient. The partial quotient is an integer, uh, a partial quotient is an integer part of the ratio of the successive uh, denominators of convergence or an integer part of a ratio of successive reminders and obviously we have a statement a criteria of badly approximability so theta is badly approximable if and only if the first inequality on suprema for uh, the ratio of successive uh, convergent denominators called as well as if and only if the infimum of the ratio of successive remainders is bounded from zero. Okay. I recall what happens in one dimensional case. Now I am going to higher dimensions. Well, this is a definition. I am speaking about linear form and simultaneous approximation. So this is a definition of badly approximable numbers in sense of simultaneous approximation. And it happens that we know from the very very beginning of the Fantan approximation that badly approximability in terms of linear form is equivalent to the badly approximability in terms of simultaneous approximation. This is the first transference theorem, and I think it was proved by Perron. So, for exponents, we have inequalities which are written at the bottom of, of my slide. So, now I am going to my next slide. And here I would like to recall the definition of jumps of irrationality measure function, the definition of best approximation. Vector. So please have a look. So this is the vector of best approximations in terms of simultaneous approximations. These are reminders, they are decreasing, and these are uh, common denominators of best approximations, they are increasing. The same happens for the linear form. However, for the linear form, we do not have just common denominator, we have a vector, and we can take the norm of this vector, let it be subnorm. And we can take the value of corresponding linear form. This is, uh, here I wrote, just rewrote the definition of uh, best approximation and the norms of vectors of the best approximation functions are increasing and the values of linear forms are decreasing. Okay. And it happened. This is my joint result with uh, my former student Renata Honjanov uh, that uh, the methods, I would like to say that this is a strange story. When I was looking for Nguyen Poel's Roa proof, I found that some details of this proof say something about uh, badly approximable numbers. So this theorem one appeared while we were reading Nguyen Poel's Roa paper. So it says that theta is badly approximable if and only if the ratio of successive denominators of best approximation is always bounded or the ratio of 
successive values of linear forms is also always bounded from zero. However, in one dimensional case, we have also the ratio of reminders. What happens here? And the phenomena is that we do not have a criteria for the ratio of remainders. And we have a curious example. So theorem two states that there exist numbers for which the ratio of remainders in simultaneous approximation is bounded from zero. However, the numbers are not badly approximable. And the similar case for linear form. So the ratio of coefficients is bounded from infinity, but the numbers are not badly approximable. So few words about few words about the proof of uh, the theorem. So it is a common. Just I will speak about theorem two. Theorem three is dual, but the proof is not immediate. You need some additional. It is very cumbersome, so. But the proof of theorem two is not so cumbersome, and the idea is very easy. So, I was speaking about the degeneracy of dimension that the matrix uh, uh, can have low rank. It, it may happen that all the best approximation vectors for a long time uh, belong to a certain two-dimensional subspace, and in this two-dimensional subspace, they behave as just uh, uh, simple approximation to one numbers. And it means that here we have uh, the rules how one number can be approximated. And in fact, we can establish here something like one dimensional bed approximability for a very, very long time. And then we can go to another two-dimensional subspace and uh, stay in this subspace for a long time and continue. So this is an idea how to prove theorem two. In some sense, it is related with degeneracy of dimension. Well, I would like to say a few words about uh, this condition. Here it is condition one. So theorem two states that it may happen that this condition is satisfied, but theta is not badly approx approx approximable. From the construction, which I tried to explain, we have that omega hat for these numbers is equal to infinity, but omega is equal to one half. So it is quite clear as uh, this vector, this the vector one, theta one, theta two cannot lie in a two dimensional subspace for a long time. And when we have a switching, when we have these three Yarnik's independent uh, excessive best approximation, in, at that moment, we get this bound for omega hat. However, it is possible to prove that if we have this strange behavior of the successive uh, remainders, then omega hat is always less than one half. So, what does it mean? It means that in oh, this Probably this should be n everywhere. It uh, this another number of thetas is n. It means that when n equal two, omega hat should be just equal one half because it is the lower bound coincides with the upper bound. However, in higher dimension, the lower bound is different. And there are some questions, obvious questions, 
what uh, which uh, up to now I do not know answer, but I do not think them to be very difficult. So what are the bounds for omega hat under such strange condition? Okay. So another story related to uh, these uh, results on badly approximable vectors deals with Dirichlet spectrum. I will uh, recall some well-known fact, fact about spectrum, about spectra. So here you see definition of Lagrange spectrum. Here you see definition of Dirichlet spectrum. Probably I do not have too much time to speak in details about problems related to these spectra. There is still there is there are a lot of problems, a lot of unsolved problems. I would like to say just that the key word for study is of Dirichlet and Lagrange spectrum is isolation. What do I mean? There are discrete parts, and it is clear that discrete parts are related to isolation theorem. However, these rays are also related to artificial isolation because to construct numbers for which the elements from rays um, are, are attained, you need to use isolation technique. You need to put some large partial quotients and to isolate the place where you get the precise bound. Also, I would like to know to note that if theta is not badly approximable, then supremum of partial quotients is equal to infinity, and it means that everything is concentrated in Lagrange spectrum here and in Dirichlet spectrum there. So I am continuing with a theorem which I like very much. This theorem was proved by two my students, Renata Khunjanov and Denis Shaskov. And when they proved it, I did not believe them. I said, you're saying something stupid, go away. But they had enough courage to struggle and indeed they prove this theorem. By the way, we do not know complete structure of Lagrange spectrum. We do not know complete structure of Dirichlet spectrum in dimension one, but in dimension two, we do know the complete structure due to Akhunjanov and Shatskov. Of course, for simplicity reason, they worked with Euclidean norm, but nevertheless, they were able to prove that the spectrum is just the whole interval. And this constant two over square root of three is related to an old theorem by Kurt Mahler about critical determinant of a cylinder. By the way, motivated by a recent paper by Berisnevich, Guan, Marna, Ramirez, and Velani, we formulate theorem one, which says that any number from Dirichlet spectrum may be attained by theta with such a property. It means by theta, which is not badly approximable. This means that uh, it is just an easy uh, consequence of uh, Akhunjanov Shatskov theorem. They were not interested in emphasizing this fact. However, this fact uh, really exists in their proof. They, what do they do? They construct for given d, they construct theta such d theta is equal, uh, is equal to d. And by the way, this is unbound. This is unbound. Well, so we have an alternative proof of a result from this paper. And moreover, so this theorem is not 
in some sense, it, it is not a new construction. You just should look into this proof and uh, just make a note that it happens so. However, motivated, but, but why? Here is we have number one. Number one means that there should be number two. Indeed, motivated by a question by Barack Weiss, we can formulate a complement to theorem one. It is theorem two. If we deal with badly approximable numbers, we can construct a dense set in Dirichlet spectrum. Moreover, we are able to calculate the parameter of density. So, so we want, so here is the Dirichlet, the Dirichlet spectrum. We want to have an epsilon uh, segment here, and we want to catch a number d theta in this segment. Uh, uh, how large can we take this m? So you see here is a footnote. So we are just calculating a good bound for this value. The problem is that if you look for this spectrum, you see that this number is greater than one. So and in this segment zero one, it is easy to calculate m from epsilon. This m. But in the rest, it is easy, but not so easy. So I hope the complete exposition will appear soon. I would like to uh, compare theorem two uh, with another result by Akhunjanov. This result deals with the structure of multidimensional Lagrange spectrum. I'm afraid I have no time to discuss the definition. Uh, however, I would like to say that it is the set of uh, exact constants for simultaneous approximation. So this in the case of simultaneous approximation. And we, uh, Akhunjanov was able to prove that in a short, interval close to zero, there is a point of Lagrange spectrum. Probably it is the best result now. It's a pity, as I want to say that uh, maybe we know nothing. It should be clear that Lagrange spectrum, the spectrum for simultaneous approximation in dimension higher than one, contains an analog of a false ray, but nobody able to prove this. Moreover, as far as I know, nobody able to prove that the spectrum is uncountable. Why? Because in dimension one, we have results related to continued fraction and to uh, artificial isolation. And here in higher dimension, we do not have continued fractions. So probably this is time to finish. I prepared an empty slide for some explanation if necessary. However, I think my time is over. So I was very happy to talk once more at uh, CIRM's conference. So thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much for the presentation. It was very interesting. And if I remember correctly, the question of Barack Weiss to you was posed at the Baikal conference or around the Baikal. No, no, no later, later. Later, OK, later. later. Okay, so it's open for discussion. Uh, maybe there are questions. Maybe Antoine Manard has some questions. He is among the audience, so no questions? I, I'd like to ask a question, if you can hear me. Yes, can we you? can hear you, of course, very well. Uh, so just to be sure I understand the theorem. So 
you prove that in higher dimension, both the Dirichlet spectrum uh, for points which are badly approximable and for the points which are not badly approximable is dense, right? So, I mean, the second statement, it becomes dense, the... For, for not badly approximable, it is not even dense, it is the same. Everything. Uh -huh. For not badly approximable, it's everything, and for badly approximable, it's just dense. You know it's dense. Is that correct? It is not. It is not everything because zero and the maximal point is not at, attained by badly approximable numbers. And uh, I believe that if we fixed M here, then it will be not a uh, complete interval, but it will be a part of interval, uh, something, a subset, and it should be interesting. I think we are not able to prove that uh, by our methods that under the condition that uh, the ratio is bounded, the spectrum is not everything. But do, uh, again, what do you think is the truth if you allow all M, but you insist on badly approximable. Is it going to be everything except the ends, or is it going to be just a dense set? Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't know. It's a, it, it, up to now, it is an interesting question. You just, mm -hmm. well, uh, this, this theorem too was motivated by your question. When we start thinking what we are able to prove, we understood that we are able to prove theorem two. But uh, up to now, probably nothing else. I should say the question comes from Kleinbach. I was basically re repeating a question of Kleinbach. I want to be clear. Yeah, so maybe this is uh, suitable to say some words on Wednesday if you sleep two nights over the last question uh -huh. of, of Barak. So maybe something could be said during the problem session. If not, now it's maybe good to think a few days on that. Uh -huh. Are there other questions? Easier ones? Um. I have more comments and a question. Yeah, please. So first, uh, maybe I should comment about these questions of on Dirichlet improbable, bad and singular, and just say a word that these techniques that you use are much stronger than what we achieved with Bresnevich, Kwan, Ramirez, and Velani, in the sense that when we use parametric geometry of numbers, um, there is the dimension that appear, and that is an error term that we cannot get rid of. So this means that we cannot construct anything with a very precise uh, value of the Dirichlet spectrum. So However, you have a result results in much more general situation. Yes, yes, yes. This is true. We have something uh, so in larger dimension, and we can impose some condition on the value of exponents but we cannot reach a specific value of the Dirichlet spectrum. So I think that it is very interesting and maybe we can combine both techniques and uh, I think there is quite a lot of interesting questions. Of course. I, I, I want to say that uh, this uh, paper by Akunjana and Shatskov proved a good result some time ago. Yes. And my second comment is about um, the conjecture for the lower bound uh, for yeah. omega over omega hat. So you said that Sumerer and Schmidt didn't state it explicitly. Actually... One, one moment, one moment. For, for, for systems of linear forms. Exactly. So what you write in the remark. So you said that maybe Wolfgang Schmidt doesn't believe that it is true because they didn't state it explicitly. But actually, no, no, no. I, I remember. I remember uh, that uh, for some 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 time ago, uh, Schmidt was trying to construct a counterexample to this conjecture when m equal n equal equal to 
Okay. I remember this. Maybe, yes, maybe. I remember some discussions about that. But I wanted to mention that uh, Wolfgang Schmidt published a paper this year in Acta Arithmetica that is quite long. And actually, so it's not formulated this way, but it states a conjecture, conjecture 8.2, that is, I think, uh, really equivalent to that. Uh, maybe maybe he changed his opinion you know sometimes yes do change their opinion i know it by myself yes but he also in this paper he also considers uh so he defines what should be a connected lm system and maybe he believes that you need the systems to be connected to have this conjecture to be true and if you have oh, disconnected oh, oh, oh. systems maybe it's not true yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know i also, I also have something something, something uh, some idea how to repair the conjecture and it's okay. related to you, you, i i said i said in my lecture i have no time to speak about this terrible case mm -hmm. in, in some states in this case we do not know Dirichlet theorem as it is not it is not linear it is not a linear theorem so this is a very exciting case if you understand uh, omega over omega hat in this case i think you will understand everything maybe not everything but <laughs> of course it would be a good this is, this is a good start exciting, okay. this is the most exciting case i agree with that <laughs>